Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to give um, everybody another few seconds to join the webinar and then we will start. Okay, so welcome to another Wells webinar. This one is Designing Unique Facades with Prefabricated Building Systems. My name is Megan and I'll just be going over a few of the Zoom functions in case anybody who's attending today uh, is unfamiliar with Zoom. So we have two functions that I wanna tell you about. One is the chat function. You can use this for any type of technical difficulties that you have. I will also be placing my email in there in case you need to get a hold of me for AIA or for certificates, um, which I'll mention in just a little bit. The other function that I want to bring to your attention is the Q&A function. This is where you can put any of the questions that you have for our presenters today, um, if uh, if you have questions. Um, so they you can you can ask them at any time during the presentation, uh, but all of the questions will be answered once they're finished with the presentation. So go ahead and use that function if you have any questions uh, about our presentation today. Um, so going to the next slide, uh, Wells is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education System. Uh, and so as such, uh, this, uh, this course is registered automatically through AIA. If you gave us your AIA number when you registered, your attendance for this course will be added automatically to the system so you don't have to do anything. Um, if you are not an AIA member, we can offer certificates of completion uh, upon request. So that's why I will be putting my email in the chat function. So you can go ahead and shoot me an email and just say, hey, I need a certificate and we'll get it to you within 10 days of the end of this webinar. Um, so this program is registered with the AIA CES for continuing professional education. There are rules and regulations that Wells must follow as a registered provider, uh, including the length of the program and the length of attendance. Uh, if you want the full version of these rules and regulations, or if you want to look at their frequently asked questions, they are available on AIA's website. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to hand it off to our first presenter, Clinton. Thank you, Megan. My name is Clinton Krell, and I am a business development manager for Wells in our Great Lakes, Wisconsin region. Gary Pooley will be presenting the second half today. And Gary is a regional sales manager from our Wells Midwest region. Wells is celebrating its 70th year of producing precast concrete. We currently have over 1,300 employees and produce more than 500 projects annually. Wells has six production facilities in four states and services the entire middle portion of the country from Canada to Mexico. There are three production facilities in Minnesota and we have one each in Colorado, Wisconsin, and Illinois. And we also have a number of sales offices scattered throughout the region. Today we'll be discussing architectural precast finishes, starting with the basics of architectural precast, and then seeing many examples of how to incorporate these finishes into beautiful examples of precast architecture. To start, we'll go over what precast concrete is, and then the finishes available, so we can have an understanding of architectural precast. Then we're gonna identify what resources are available for specifying and designing architectural precast. And through many images of current architectural precast projects, we will discuss the possibilities of architectural precast. And finally, and perhaps the most important takeaway will be to inspire the designs of future architectural precast projects. So let's begin by starting with some precast basics. First of all, architectural precast is simply precast concrete that is poured into a form and is the, ex the exterior face of a structure. It's an extremely durable and customizable building material and it can be incorporated into structures in many different ways. Uh, this material can be an architectural cladding or a structure that is simply a solid thickness of concrete that's applied to the exterior of a structure. It can be used to contribute to the structural strength of a building and participate in supporting the gravity loads and the lateral loads applied to the structure. 
An example of this would be a load bearing wall panel or a structural spandrel in a parking deck like what's shown in the center photo. And it can even incorporate insulation and contribute to the energy efficiency of the structure it's used on. Architectural precast concrete is simply concrete that has ingredients chosen based on the desired appearance of the finished product. Precast concrete is very durable and the mix design uses very specific components, including cement, water for hydration of the cement, commonly a pigment for color, fine aggregate, which is sand, and coarse aggregate, which is stone. And typically it has admixtures that will help improve the production process and overall durability of the final product. After the concrete is mixed, it's taken to a casting bed, which in a precast plant is very close by, and then poured into a form. The concrete takes the shape of the form it's cast into and will be as smooth as the surface it's cast against. When taken out of the form, smooth concrete will have a non-uniform color and will mimic any surface imperfections that may have been in the casting form. The solution to minimizing and eliminating unwanted non-uniformity of color or small imperfections is to introduce color and finishes. The top surface of the concrete that has been placed in a form will need to be finished manually. If this surface will be concealed, minimal work needs to be done. But if this surface will be exposed to view, it's likely hand or machine trowel smooth. Finishes on, on this top surface is, uh, sur surface is limited and um, are not the focus of our discussion. We just want you to know that they do exist. If a finish is required on this side, it's likely uh, mechanically broomed or raked by pulling a broom or a specific rake pattern over the top of the plastic concrete. This surface can also have a retarder sprayed on it to delay the hardening of the cement. If this is the case, after the panel is stripped, water is used to wash off the cement paste layer that is not hardened yet, exposing the aggregates in the mixed design. Architectural precast has three major components, color, texture, and sculpture. The desired color is achieved by selecting a cement color, a pigment, as well as fine and coarse aggregates. Texture is achieved through the finishes that are applied and the use of form liners and veneers. And sculpture is where architectural precast can really show off. The shape of the forms and the use of reveals and form liners all contribute to the final sculptural shape of the precast. Cement comes in two colors, gray and white. Gray cement is what traditional concrete is made from and is much less expensive than white. However, gray cement varies widely in, cover, in color and can lead to non-uniformity in the color of the precast. Architectural precasts can appear mottled or blotchy with gray cement. When pigments are used with gray cement, the resulting colors are duller than concrete used with white cement. White cement does improve the color uniformity and overall brightness of the precast, but it is considerably more expensive. Blending the two cements is an option to improve the color uniformity of the gray cement while saving on the cost of an all white cement mix. Pigments are dry or liquid colors that are added to the mix in proportion to the amount of cement. These images are examples of the range of colors that concrete um, is available in using different pigment dosages from one to 5%. And, and these images are, um, uh, or the, the pigment dosage is corresponding to the color of the cement. So the left column is made with gray cement and the right column is made with white. And in the middle is a 50-50 blend of the two. Increasing the pigment amount will increase the boldness of the color but there is a practical limit to how much pigment can be used. Too much pigment will affect the concrete's durability and compromise its strength. It can cause dusting of the surface where the pigment can leach out of the concrete over time, or perhaps equally critical is delay the initial strength of the concrete, forcing the precast to remain in the beds longer before stripping. And precast beds need to be, be turned over every day to capitalize on the cost efficiency and the schedule advantage that is inherent in precast concrete construction. Texture can be achieved by manipulating the exposed face of the precast. We'll discuss each of these briefly in the coming slides. 
finishes like acid etch, sandblast, exposed aerate, which is also called water wash, and mechanically applied finishes like rake or hammered are processes that are done to modify the concrete surface. Form liners are used to cast the concrete against with the concrete taking the shape of the form liner. And veneers like stone, thin brick, and terracotta can be placed in the form and they become integral with the precast concrete. Likely the most common finish applied to architectural precast is acid etch. The panel is stripped from the bed and moved to a finishing station at the plant and washed with a mild acid. The acid removes a thin outside layer, a surface layer of the concrete, and it reveals a pigmented cement paste and the fine aggregates. There are varying depths that can be achieved uh, with acid etch and a deeper etching promotes more panel color uniformity. However, there is a limit to the, app, to the etching depth. Acid etching also uh, tends to slightly darken the surface of the concrete. Like acid etch, sandblast is a process done in the yard after the panel is stripped, but it uses an abrasive under pressure to remove the outer layer of the cement paste and reveals the sand and if deep enough, the coarse aggregates. Since this process is manual, the uniformity of the finish is highly dependent on the skill of the person doing the blasting. The process of sandblasting tends to lighten the surface of the precast. An exposed aggregate finish is started earlier in the production process where a retarder that delays the set of the cement is painted on a form and the concrete is cast over the top of it. When it gets to the finishing station in the yard, the surface of the panel is simply washed off, removing the unset cement paste and revealing the sand and coarse aggregate. The varying depths of exposed aggregate are achieved by using different types of retarders. And this is the most uniform finish uh, for color and texture of the three that we just discussed. Form liners bring practically unlimited options to architectural precast. There are form liners to replicate any building material or shape that can be envisioned. They are simply a plastic or rubber liner that gets set into a form and the concrete is poured over the top of it. Price of the form liners will vary with the intended number of uses. Single form, single use form liners are typically a thin plastic and will be much cheaper than a multi-use rubber form liner, but it will have some limitations of pattern and depth. Form liners can be picked out of a catalog or custom made for your project and formliner manufacturers' websites are good resources to explore when you're using them in your design. And your local precaster can help you through the selection of a formliner manufacturer. Precast really demonstrates its versatility when veneers are introduced. Veneer thin brick, like what's shown here, or stone or terracotta can be cast into the precast and can also be used as an accent material in combination with exposed precast concrete. A formliner is used to accurately place the veneer into. So when the concrete is poured on top of it, the veneer is in the proper place and orientation. Relatively new to the industry is micro etching. This process starts with an image that is printed onto paper using a retarder as the ink. And the paper with uh, the image is placed into the form and concrete is poured directly on top of it. Like the exposed area process, the panel is stripped and taken to the yard, and uh, the delayed set cement paste is washed off, revealing the image. The images that can be used are limitless, from geometric designs to pixelated photos. Other finish options include mechanically applied finishes like a rake or a hammer. A rustic stone or a limestone effect can be achieved by using multiple colored mixes and treating the formwork prior to pouring against the form liner. A honed or a polished concrete is a very time consuming process. So the price of this finish will reflect the manpower used to produce it. And simply using a form liner and staining the surface is a great option to replicate brick or stone and get the color you like, but not have the high cost of all those materials. So there are a lot of finish options available. An early step when designing architectural precast is to reach out to your local precaster and discuss your project. The precaster is there to help you every step of the way from picking out concrete mixes to coordinating an efficient architectural precast design.
Along with the help of a precaster, a must-have resource for designing architectural precast is PCI MNL 122. Chapter six in this manual contains a guide specification that will walk you through a proper architectural precast specification. Your local precaster can also help you with writing a specification as well. Referenced in the specification is PCI MNL 117, which is the quality control standard for architectural precast. These manuals and the specification can be found at PCI's website, pci.org. After precast has been properly designed and specified, you're gonna to need to make sure it's produced by a qualified precaster. Precast certification changed in 2021 with a new certification scale and requirements of the precaster. This new certification scale is what should be referenced for all projects moving forward. Both PCI and Wells have webinars specifically about this new certification process, which do a great job of digging into the topic. And I, rec I recommend checking them out, but I wanna mention a couple of key points. The new architectural certification is based on complexity and the images in this slide are the mock-ups each precaster must master to achieve each level of certification. Any of these certification categories require a written quality assurance process and appropriately certified pers personnel. For comparison to the old certification scale, the new AC category is similar to the previous A1 architectural category. Levels AA and AB have been created to be more demanding than the old A1 category and has the added requirement of two yearly surprise site and plant audits. All of Wells architectural precast plants are AA certified. And by choosing a PCI certified precaster, you are assuring what has been designed is what's going to be built. So now I'm gonna be handing off control to Gary to take you the rest of the way. Okay, thank you, Clinton. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, um, now we're going to get into showing all the things that Clinton talked about in the first half of this, and we're going to take a look at some examples of buildings that have been built that, that use the different finishes and the different textures and all the unique things we can do to create a specific look. Okay, this first example um, is a building in Bloomington, and it's a manufacturing facility for a medical device company. It was erected a year ago, and it combines a couple of unique finishes. Um, number one, the lighter finish on this charcoal color is a polished finish, and the darker color is an acid etched finish. And you can see how the two colors bounce around, and they're broken up by full height windows. And we feel that the, um, the, the three colors and the three looks go very well together. One unique thing about the polished portions is because the, the, the ease, to make it easier to polish this, we, we lay the panels down on their back so that the exterior face is faced up in our production facility. And when we run the polishers on there, it's important to know that the polished area should project out from the acid etch area. That way the, the pads can run over the edge and it becomes a very cost-effective way to do the polishing. If that were not the case and it were reversed, we'd have to be really careful not to touch the, the side edge of the, the other projecting part with the polishing machine and it becomes a little bit more labor intensive. As we round the corner on the same building, <clears throat> some inset areas were used. Um, just to break up the length of the building, but I think it's just a good example of how to take a simple precast wall, incorporate the right finishes, you, the utilization of the full height glass really makes this building pop. This is another example of a couple of panels that are in our yard. And this is for a safety and security building at the Minneapolis airport. And they chose a, a three different finishes for the exterior. Um, 
On the left hand side, you can see the vertical ribs. This was a form liner finish to create these, these flutes or these ribs. Um, in the middle here is a polished finish. And again, you can see how they utilize the, the, the projecting part of the panel to be the polished finish to get the economics out of it. And then they recessed it back and the bottom of it is an acid finish or an etched finish. This example is a medical office building in Hudson, Wisconsin. Um, this happens to be a, a total precast building. So the interior uh, precast columns, beams, double T's, some solid slabs. And then the exterior is an insulated vertical wall or spandrel system. So basically everything other than the glass that you're seeing here is precast. This is a close-up view of this. And the, the different finishes that we're seeing here, um, the light gray and the dark, this is a stained finish on a standard gray panel. And the stain has some reflective qualities to it which really makes it look like a metal panel. The bottom part or the buff part was done with a colored mix design um, with a block pattern on it and an etching process that gives it a rustic or an aged look. So this is the finished product. This is not stained. This is the way it came to the site from the precaster. The same building as you round the corner and go to the main entry area had a unique large column that supported um, uh, a covered entry area. Um, this, in this case, a wood grain finish was used on gray concrete and two-toned finish uh, stained colors were used to give it this unique wood look. On the bottom, you can see a, a dark stain was used to create the patterns here, the splock pattern. And in the background, you can see the, the finishes and the unique pieces that we previously discussed. And this is the final shot of this structure. I just, I think it pictures say a thousand words, right? And I, I really like the way the different finishes came together, the horizontal pieces that are wood grain finish. And this wood grain finish again is on, a, on an insulated panel. So you get the look of wood, but you get the durability of the, of the precast concrete. And then how they blend into the columns, I think is a really unique look. And this bottom black stripe right here within the buff colored um, look that was they just stained it it came out with this buff color in it and they decided to create a black line that would complement the black stains up above one final thought on staining precast is the precaster really has to treat it like it's an architectural finish even though it's gray concrete it it can't be a grade b finish it has to be a the form has to be clean and the form has to be true um, because any deformalities in the form would show up in the staining. So it really has to be an architectural grade gray concrete panel. And that'll, that'll give you a much more successful look. Now, Clinton talked a little bit about micro etching. We've done a handful of jobs using um, the micro etching process, which is really you order a, a piece of paper from one or three or four manufacturers around the world and they print um, retarder on the paper. And the retarder can come in one of three depths to give you a different depth of etch on it. And when you pour on the paper, um, you strip the piece the next day and you wash the retarder off. And in this case, the retarder, we, well, number one, we used a, a, a lighter gray mix and we used a black sand. So you can't see the black sand in the areas that are not retarded, but where the retarder was allowed to eat away at the surface, um, the black sand came through. So it gives you a lot of contrast and a very unique look. Now, one of the the things to consider when doing this, the different manufacturers of the paper have standard patterns and they can have 20, 30, hundreds of standard patterns. So there's a lot to choose from there. And when you look at them, it's very easy for them to reverse the look and use more retarder 
use the retarder in the white areas and vice versa for the black areas. So you really have, you have a darker panel with, with lighter gray circles in it. And you can easily switch that out within the building too, because the way that they'll consider it a standard pattern where the, and you can switch where the retarder is. Another example of that same finish is a building that is in um, South Minneapolis called the Family Partnership. And the designers did a couple of really unique things on this building. Number one, this column on the right-hand side is at their main entry area. And what they did here is they just, they used the, the, the micro etching to create a map of the neighborhood. And the map identifies where all the public parks are. And then as you round the corner and get closer to the door, um, they spelled out the word welcome in 20 to 30 different languages. And an interesting part to this was is it's the designers and sure had to work really hard to make sure they had the correct spelling and the correct look for all the different languages. And before we poured, we realized we had something wrong. We had to order the paper twice. And really what it came down to is in the, the braille image of the word welcome, we had missed the last dot. So unfortunately we had to make the paper twice, but the piece looks great. And then on the left-hand side, you can see the patterning for the majority of the same building. And the different squares represent, they're, they're patterns that represent the different neighborhoods in the community. So a lot of thought and care was put into this. Again, you can get some really custom cool looks using the micro etching. Um, this building is a medical office building um, that is in Stillwater, Minnesota. And I, I wanted to show this because, you know, what the designers do are doing here is they're, we're all used to seeing precast buildings. And when you see a, a warehouse or there's a big box that's made out of precast, you can see the a 12 foot wide wall system or a 10 foot wide wall system just be repetitive. What the designers did here is they use that same philosophy to gain the economics. So for instance, when you look at this center part with the brick in it, it's a cast in thin brick and a an, uh, sandblast finish below and above the windows and an etched finish here. There's an etched finish at the bottom that has uses um, reveals to create a block pattern. The panels were 12 foot wide. You can kind of see the, the, the joints here. And the key to this is to make it repetitive. So as we marched around the building, we were able to use the same molds over and over again, making it very cost effective. And then we sprinkled in right at the main entry area here, there's just some standard flat panels with that same mixed design, same color, that same acid etch finish. These are metal panels. Um, there is a precast backup behind it and the folks were able just to come and apply the metal panels to the precast. Now, again, the picture to the right here represents, just gives you a good example of that repetitive finish. You know, And this is the wall that had the clinic offices and the doctor's offices and the different levels and a very unique custom look. But in reality, we're making use of the economics of utilizing one mold. The picture to the left, this is the gymnasium for the rehabilitation part of the clinic. And I really like how the designers, again, started off with a flat etched finish and then we were able to create a mold where we had, a, 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 again, a 12 foot wide panel that was insulated and we projected this column look out four and five inches. And then finally we transitioned to, we transitioned to just the column look. So it just, it gives this precast wall just a very unique classic look. And then I, I, I got a couple more shots of this building because it's one of my favorites. Um, but to the right here, again, this is just meant to show all the detail and all the care that was taken to make this look, give it this classic look. Um, the projection and the different finish of the window seals. And then in between the windows, we bumped that same look up to give it a kind of a little bit of a unique look here. Um, we used a return finish, or excuse me, an L-shaped brick to return the brick so to, to get back to the edge of the window frame. And then above the windows, 
rather than using trying to incorporate a soldier course brick look to it, we just bumped that piece out by that part of the panel out by one inch and again gave it a lighter finish similar to the sill below. And here's the final shot of the main entry of that building. You know, we used a little bit different dimensions to this. This wall came out at an angle, um, so it accentuates the main entry. Another way um, to, to, to utilize precast is in a large office building um, by combining vertical and horizontal elements. In this particular project, um, the cladding, the charcoal pieces on the bottom are vertical walls. And then the, the white pieces you see are spandrels. So they're horizontal pieces connected to the building. And although they have a very unique look to them, it's the spandrels are the same size other than the very top one at the parapet. So we were able to create molds. So basically the mold, we take a 160 foot long form and we'll create a continuous shape like the spandrel. And then we're able to pour the different lengths of spandrels required for the building in that same form. So again, you're min you have a very custom unique setup, but you're minimizing the cost of that setup because you're able to reuse it. Now, if this building had spandrels that um, had different heights at every level and maybe changed within each level so that you can end up with nine, 10, 12 different forms. But in this case, we ended up with two, very economical. We can do it either way, but it's just important to understand the economics of it. And one other unique, thing about this is in the charcoal pieces. Um, we were able to return the finish more than the standard inch and a half that you see um, so that they could get a setback and a shadow on the window. It's back about six inches in this particular building. This is the Boston Scientific Building. This is in Maple Grove, Minnesota. And I wanted to show this one because again, it's a, it's a pretty unique design. The designer spent a lot of time um, thinking about how they wanted this to look, but yet they wanted to achieve the economics of precast. So what we did is we created some specialized pieces on the exterior, these column pieces that are three foot wide by three foot thick. And that was that allowed them to set back the windows. So one of the philosophies behind this is let's let's try and think of it like it's a standard insulated wall but add to the exterior what we need to add to get the look. So you can see as we, on the right here, you can see as we march along, we have a pretty standard 12 inch insulated panel. And then as we get to these windows, we set the wall back two feet. So this is a metal panel that's, that's covering the, the precast wall. And then as we wanted to show these projections, we just, we added to the 12 inch thickness Typically you have a three inch exterior wife. In this case, we had a two foot three inch exterior wife. And I'll show you how that looks in a sketch. So these elements um, basically look like this. This is your six inch, typically your, your interior wife, your insulation. And then instead of a thin three inch wife with the thin brick cast in out here, we cast the thin brick like this. So this was the bottom of the form. This is the edges of the form and we had to glue the brick to the liner to get it to stay and carefully pour these pieces. But again, it gives it that really unique look and you can see how the windows are set back. So the center of the window is on the insulation line. So it offers that continuous insulation and the insulation line matches the window frame. And so you get that value that you typically get out of a precast building, but yet you get this very, very unique look. And the upper pieces were L-shaped. Again, similar to this, they were L-shaped and just sat on the projecting columns. Okay, the next example is a manufacturing facility um, that is a very large building. And the challenge here is, you know, there's there's so many storage building and manufacturing buildings and warehouses out there and, you know, they, a lot of them are precast flat wall 
couple of reveals, maybe some different colors via staining. Um, this one, they, the designers wanted to do something a little bit different. So they talked about using a form liner, um, but because of the size of the building, they had decided not to. And we were able to make a mold that this is a, this is a cross section of the panel that if you follow this line, this would be the bottom of our form. And then this would be the side rails of the form. And they repeated this look over and over again. And again, we were able to make a mold, minimal cost, reuse and repour on that mold over and over again to get a unique look. It's a charcoal finish. The lighter colors are sandblast and the darker colors are an etched finish. And then in the front of that same building, we use the same pattern, but we used a lighter gray mix design with those same finishes. And the dark areas here are metal panel. Um, it's a three foot vertical with a six foot opening and then another three foot vertical. So what we did is we started off with a 12 foot panel and we we just eliminated the exterior white, covered it with a metal panel, did the same thing here. And then this is the full thickness of the panel. And then we repeated that piece, we jumped six feet. So this is a little six foot piece right here. And then you have that another 12 foot wide panel that goes all the way up. And then in between, um, rather than put a, you could put a backup piece here, but I think they just put a, a piece of steel across to pick up the, the floor and the roof structure. Very simple, but very uh, unique look. Again, making use of the repetition. Now, this is a recreation center in, in Austin, Minnesota. And the designers here wanted the, this to really accentuate the windows with some white, part of the panel would be white and, and it would reach up to the sky. So what you're seeing here is a stack bond brick cast into the precast. And then we have one foot strips of a polished white finish and then a two foot window and a one foot piece of precast and a two foot window. And again, we used a 12 foot wide panel to panelize this. And when we first looked at this and brought it back to our office, we thought, oh man, there's just not enough panel left to create this and handle it. Um, through meeting with the design team and looking at a couple of different options, what we were able to do is simply add two inches to the what would normally be the six inch back wife. So instead of a 12 inch panel, we had a, a 14 inch panel. And that, you know, increasing the back thickness of this and the thickness of the overall panel allowed us to produce this. So you can see the stack bond brick, you can see the polished white precast coming down here, and then you can see the etched bottom. And again, this polished white area does stick out about a half of an inch so that you're able to run the polishers on it. Um, one of the other parts of the design of this panel that can be an important piece to talk about is we push the window frames to the outside of the wall. And I think because of everything that was going on in the wall, recessing them back wasn't, wasn't adding to the wall. But what it did is now we no longer had to try and polish, you know, the one and a half or two inch return edge on each side of these. And we no longer had to find a, a long L-shaped brick to create this or try and use a soldier course, which would kind of ruin the look of the patterning. And then they didn't have to use a piece of flashing down here. So we're able to save a lot of costs by moving this window out to the exterior. Um, this is the 10 West office building and parking ramp in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Um, the exterior of the office building is precast. You can see on the lower levels, we used uh, vertical panels that went that covered that went from ground to the second floor, covered the first floor and then the second floor, and then we used a uniquely shaped arched piece horizontally that went from vertical to vertical. Now all of these panels stacked on one another. Um, as we jumped up to the to the upper levels we switched to a horizontal panel system with two large openings in it to create the windows. And again, this gave us a lot of repetition on the building as we moved up the building. Um, there was a lot of brick, a lot of return brick, and then we ac accentuated the building by using uh, a, 
a color, an architectural color that complemented the brick, and then we etched it to give it this kind of these, these horizontal line looks. This is an example. Of course, this is, as you can see, it's a fire and rescue station in Albert Lee. Um, again, using uh, an insulated wall system to get a unique look. The brick on this is a tumbled brick, which means the edges are, are rough, they're not squared off. The dimensional quality is, is not what a really tight tolerance brick would be in precast. Normally you see that tight PCI tolerance. In this case, um, this was a request by the owner. They wanted this rustic look. So we just worked with the brick supplier and a form liner company to um, get the liner to match the brick so that we could get this, this unique look. And it turned out pretty well. I also like the fact that um, we took these, these vertical wall panels and have almost full height windows in them. And rather than returning the L brick to, to meet the windows on top and on the sides, we just let the brick stop. And then we etched this buff colored finish that was used for the mortar joints. And it really just accentuates this vertical window look. And then over here where the lettering is, that's a sandblast finish on the typical 12 inch sandwich panel. You can see the bumped out ledge and then a, a, a stone faced form liner. And then some metal pieces were used on the, the this wall marches down. It was got, I got a dozen windows in it and they used a channel, a metal channel on the exterior to really give it a cool look. And then this form liner finish, this is precast as well. Um, was the buildings built into the side of a hill. So they just made a small room for utilities with a lunch break deck on top. So a very, very unique look. Um, this is Minnesota Air National Guard. So the challenge here was how do you take a very long wall um, office buildings and make it look unique? And we utilized a, a, a 12 inch panel and the panels can be 10 or 12 inch. 12 inch is probably the most cost effective. And there is a joint in the middle of this form liner finish. And then the window opening, uh, there's actually a punched window only where the windows in the for the offices are. We did continue the exterior structural in what excuse me the interior structural white and the here and at the floor level, and then they covered it with spandrel glass. So again, it gives it just a very unique um, vertical look. So if we transition now to what is the future of mixed designs? Um, the future of mixed designs, we're looking at a number of different things for aggregate replacements. Um, there are things that have been tried in the past. Some of them are, are relatively new. Um, we could take rolled and crushed glass and use it as an aggregate substitute. Uh, in the mix. You have to be a little bit careful because the glass, if the glass is too round, it doesn't act or set real well with the with the concrete. And so a lot of times you want some edges on it. I remember, I'm old enough to remember trying this 30 years ago. And um, in our wells facility, we were going to make a sign for up by the highway. And it was our own sign for our, for our production plant. And the goal there was to drink enough sky blue vodka and crush the glass jars so that we could get a blue tint to the precast. And I think we were successful back then. But that same philosophy, you know, folks will do that. It, that glass can be, the right glass can be a little bit tough to get a hold of, so you have to be careful. In a, and then not in Minnesota, but in some of the states that border the oceans and the seas, seashells are used as an aggregate replacement and they have been for years. There's other recycled material that people are playing with. Some rubbers are out there. They're not having much luck with the bond. Um, and then they're taking some recycled material from countertop materials and, 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 and trying to mix those colors together and, and, and utilize that and in precast as well. And all this stuff is, you have to be a little bit careful because you got to find the right material that won't affect the strength of the concrete too much. Um, but it is, there are things, these are things that we're working on. Now, how do you, 
how do you start? How do you achieve your vision? Um, the picture to the left um, is what I call our idea room. I mean, it's in our sales office and many precasters have something just like this. Some are outside, some are inside. Um, it's just an ex a series of recent mixed designs that we've used in a one foot by one foot samples. Um, so what we'll go through is if you come and see us is we'll, we'll listen first of all and understand what you're looking for. Are we looking for thin brick form liners, different colors? And then we'll start taking some of these aggregates in sand samples and trying to mix them with a sand sample and sometimes you can mix two aggregates together, two sands together to get kind of a specific color that you're looking for. And then you mix it like Clint, Clinton had said earlier on with a, with, a, with a white or a gray cement and a color additive. And you really want those to complement one another. You try not to have a salt and pepper look because then you can get some blotchy areas. There are some mixed designs that will work with that, but just work with your precaster. Um, precasters around the United States have a wealth of knowledge so they can help guide you. Um, and then this little box is our traveling box for folks that really, really are just early on taking a look at what can precast offer. We'll bring these little samples with the little finishes. And then of course, um, we've got brick pattern or, or examples of bricks available with the different, the rolled brick and the, 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 the higher, um, the higher tolerance brick here, examples of different form liners. And after we go through that, what we'd like to do is land on a color range that you're looking for. So this is actually, I get a little bit of grief from this because I look like I'm selling precast out of the back of my pickup, but it's exactly what I was doing in this case. And um, this customer was looking for a buff color. They ended up choosing this one and there's three different finishes on it. But, you know, you couldn't have got here without them coming to visit us and see the, the, the vast selection that we have to choose from. And then once we do select a one by one, um, what that leads to is the mock-up and the mock-up will be for final approval. So this happens to be a mock-up that needs to show a lot of different things. It needs to show a, a, a block pattern on the bottom, the projecting sill, a half size window, because they're actually going to put a window in here and make sure that the window fits well and is in line with the insulation and that the, the return brick works out well. And then this is just an etched with vertical reveals. Another part of of looking at a mock-up and approving a mock-up is looking at the back of it, not only for the quality of the finish, you know, if it's an exposed finish, there'll be what we'll do is a machine trawl finish. Um, some precasters have a high-end hand trawled finish, but just communicate with them and make sure you're getting the achieved or the desired finish. Also worth noting is when we etch, we do a lot of etching, especially on darker colored panels, that etching will bleed over onto the back during the process and it is in many times impossible to get off. So we want to show folks that and make sure that they understand what it's going to look like. A simple paint will cover it up, um, but it's just something worth noting. And then also, you, you know, for if you get a chip in the precast and you have to patch it, you can't use the same mix design that you use to pour the piece because the dry piece is going to suck the water out of that little patch mix very quickly and it can darken it or lighten it. So we will make a small four by four piece and we'll do a number of samples until we achieve the correct mix design for a patch. And many times the architect wants to, or the owner wants to approve that. And that's, that's a smart part of the approval process. One other thing to do is that we have in a lot of precursors have this is we have a frame that we use to hang a performance mock-up. This happens to be for a 34 story building in downtown Minneapolis um called north loop green and what this does is not only does it give you a, the the color and the texture uh it demonstrates the window size so that the window manufacturer can come in and take a look make sure that his windows fit but it also demonstrates all the connections on the inside of the building so that we can make sure that we're taking up only enough room so that they get covered up and then to the right you can see approving a mock-up panel like this we we actually hung it from the tower crane 
in the future position of where it would be on the building, even though the building's not there. And then we all stood back on the street and looked at it, made sure it matched some of the surrounding colors. And that was, that worked out well. And here's that building today. So um, we're getting towards the end here. And um, we have a new architectural inspiration guide that's going to be launched tomorrow. And Megan, who you heard from in the beginning of this presentation, is going to put a link in the chat to that. And it's a bunch of photos and statements real similar to what we looked, not the same, but similar to what we went through today. And it's just meant for to show everybody where precast has gone, where architectural precast has gone, and what we're capable of. And at this point, um, we are going to answer questions. So Clinton, I'm gonna ask you to come back on and help me with this, please. Yeah, yeah, um, we do have a few questions and a one shout out. Um, so Gary, uh, the first question is, can you provide an order of magnitude for considerably more expensive for white cement over gray cement? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, so if you took a if you took a a yard of concrete and it's gray and it cost one hundred and fifty dollars, if you take the gray cement out and you put white cement in, um, it'll probably cost you one hundred and seventy five dollars. It's not a big cost increase. What, what I tell clients is there's so many things that come together. So work with your precast to, to understand where the costs are. Like if you're looking at a white panel, there's some white sands and aggregates out there that you use with white cement. And that mixed design can cost you $600 a yard because it's, it's, it's snow white, it, but it comes from a long ways away. Many times your producer will have a local white aggregate that you can have a hard time telling the difference you'll drop it from six hundred dollars a yard to 220 easy so there's just my advice is there's a lot of things that come together in a mixed design and just make sure your precaster is telling you about the the white versus gray what sands are you using and what aggregates are you using okay gary um uh, i have a question about post applied paints and stains um, and how does the concrete color affect the stain? And should the stain, um, uh, does, does the color of the concrete telegraph through the stain? It's, it is my experience that when we are introducing a stain on a precast panel um, that is meant to have a form liner and a, a, a stain to let's say mimic um, thin brick, um, the, concrete that we use is just a simple plain gray concrete and the stain is applied with a low nap roller that is over that just applies stain to the very uh, face of the precast and that stain um, does not it, it is is um, opaque enough where the color of the concrete it, it's it's not affected um, we also have projects where uh, like many of your your, your projects have a stain applied to a concrete. I'm assuming that that is applied to a gray concrete. Can you talk a little bit further of how, um, sure. what, how the stain is affected and, and what color concretes you use? Yeah, so I would, I would say that it, it is applied to just a, there's, there's no reason to color the concrete. You just use a gray concrete um, unless, Another part of the panel requires that the bottom half is an architectural finish, you know, with something in it. And um, but you know, when we looked at, it's important to do a mock-up as well with staining. So for that that medical office building that I showed you with the different colors of stains, um, we went through a number of mock-ups. And one of the mock-ups we made, we we applied the stain to it, and the stain it it the the gray concrete did telegraph through the staining. So what we did is we realized that it needed a different tone in the stain, or I think we may have put in two, co put two coats of it on there. So that's, 
it it can happen, but it's just part of the mock-up stage. So your your precaster needs to work with your staining company, and there's a lot of good ones out there. And then the other thing is, is I wouldn't be afraid to just nick a corner of that mock-up and and you have to define the quality of a patch, right? In case something gets nicked so that your, your patching crew can get it to the point where the stain people can stain over that and it won't telegraph through. You can do it and it's not that difficult. It's just something that you need to do up front. That's a very good point, Gary. Um, here's another question. What is the added cost for micro etching? Well, that's that's another good question. So. If you go to one of those companies and if you choose one of their standard patterns, which again, there can be hundreds of them or a variation of it, you can rotate it 90 degrees or you can, they, they can do different things with it. Um, you know, that, that, that can be as, as, it can be similar to like the cost of adding thin brick to a project, which can be 10 to $15 a square foot. Now, and that's on the low end. Now, when I showed that example of that, that signage with the different languages in it, that was a custom piece. And we've done pieces for religious buildings where they'll take Proverbs out of the Bible, which is, you know, in the old days, we used to have to set the letters in the form and try and get all that right. It's wonderful to use a piece of paper to just print that right off of a document. That's custom. So that can cost well over $100 a square foot. For a custom look like that that sign i think when we looked at it there's no square footage there right so it was probably i paid six eight hundred dollars a square foot for it but there's only a couple handfuls of square foot so now gary one thing you talked about um is the projections and um the sculpture of the panels uh, one question here is how does increasing the thickness of the forms for projection details affect the cost of the panel. Yep. So number one, there, there are some limitations to that. You know, you, what you don't want is you don't want a really thin piece projecting from the panel because you'd be afraid that you'd lose it during stripping or shipping or something like that. So you don't want something that sticks out six inches and it goes from two inches to one inch. Um, but your precaster will help you understand what those limitations are. And what, what I would tell you is that it's it's more important to get a repetitiveness out of your pattern than it is to worry about the little details of the pattern. Because we're going to make a mold and we can have some really, like if it takes three days to make a mold or you get really unique with it, it takes a fourth or a fifth day to make a mold. As long as you let us reuse that mold, we're going to pour four or five, four panels a day for 30 days, you know, you get to divide that upfront cost into that 30 days or 90 pieces of precast, right? So it, it dilutes in there. So I, what I'm saying is I wouldn't worry so much about the mold. I would worry more. I would try to use it repetitively. Okay, Gary. And uh, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So let's have one last question here. Uh, I'd like to know if you need to acid etch and or use white concrete to get a white look. So I would use white cement in the mix to get a white look because, you know, you, gray, sometimes gray can look kind of light, but gray concrete is gray concrete. It's going to be a little bit different shade of gray every day. So I would use, I would use white cement and then I would use a complementary sand and aggregate and then I would put a light etch on it. And I would pay more attention to the sand because when you etch it, you're going to see a whole bunch of the sand and you're going to see just the, the edges of the rock. So I'd maybe spend more money on the, getting a sand I liked than I would a rock because of the percentage of the sand you're going to see versus the aggregate in an etched situation. If you don't etch it, the white cement's going to pick up every little, if you have a footprint on the form, it'll pick up the image of that footprint. So that light etch cleans all that up. Well, Gary, thank you for all your insight um, with these questions. Um, I guess that concludes our webinar today. Thank you all for joining us. Yeah, thanks everyone. Bye now.